Hey guys, stick around. We're going to talk to Kyle Bodie of Driveline Baseball and Mason McRae about the MLB draft and some under-the-radar prospects. You are listening to KC Sports Network, the number one podcast network for today's Kansas City sports fans. With former players from your favorite teams, informed perspectives, and former insiders, this is the place for you. You can find us wherever you listen to podcasts or on our YouTube channel, all over social media, or our morning newsletter, KCSN Daily, dedicated to your Kansas City Chiefs. KC Sports Network is proudly presented by Emprise Bank, your partner in possible. All right, welcome back to another episode of the Royals Farm Report podcast. My name is Alex Duvall. I am still in the process of moving, but at least I have not a white wall behind me now. So it's a little bit decorated, but I'm still technically in the process of moving. So there's that. I am joined tonight, actually today. So just for reference sake, it is Wednesday the 29th when we're recording. We're going to air this on July 11th that way. It is more time appropriate for the draft. I am leaving town next week, but we had to get this episode in. So uh, this will be aired a week before the draft for the draft, but we're recording a little bit early. So uh, do be wary if things change. We're joined tonight by Josh Kaiser, my co-host. Joshua, how are we doing? It's uh, I feel good. I, I haven't been on the podcast for the last couple of weeks, so it's good to be back uh, back on with you and got some fun guests to talk about some draft coverage um, to, to go today. So I'm pumped. Absolutely. Really quick before we get started here, let's hear a word from Kansas City Strength and Conditioning. From the beginning, we knew right away that we wanted to do strength and conditioning and a throwing program for the baseball and softball community. It wasn't something we were trying to back into or all of a sudden learn. We knew we were really good at these coaching these skills from the get-go. And the fact that we're in the same business and the employees are all on the same page, you know, we can write a program based off of what a kid needs, not just getting him stronger or faster from a general sense. It's what does this kid need? On the pitching end, we can say, hey, this kid needs such and such. He needs to do this or that better. A lot of times it turns out it's not something that needs to be fixed in the baseball cage or on the throwing mat, it actually needs to be fixed in the weight room. All right. Big, big thank you to Kansas City Strength and Conditioning for picking up the podcast this year. If you got a teenager, uh, baseball or softball, send them out to KCSC in Olathe at home field to get their training. I've got a kid that's out there right now who has loved every minute of it. And when he asked me this past spring, hey, any advice on where to train? He's like, you need to go out to KCSC. Go out there, let them get you right. They have more, more ability to read your body, to read your strength and flexibility flaws, and to help you get right on the mound through the weight room than anybody I know of. So a really good outlet there for all athletes, all ages. Get them out there. The home of Scott Barlow this past offseason, one of the best relievers in baseball. So it's good enough for Scott. It's good enough for me. So, Josh, like you said, I'm excited to get a couple of guests on here. We're going to talk to Kyle Bodie of Driveline Baseball about draft process. And I think the thing that I'm most excited about to ask him is the difference, not just between scouting and player development, because we all know how those two are different, but how do they intermingle? Can you out develop bad scouting? Can you out scout bad development? So we'll talk about some different ways that those two interline and intersect uh, on the podcast tonight. We're also going to have Mason McRae on. Mason has been on the podcast before. Mason has the most unique outlook on the MLB draft of anybody that I've talked to. So I'm really excited to get Mason's outlook on the draft. Very analytically inclined. And I think because he's so analytically inclined, he was ahead of the curve on a guy like Trey Sweeney, who now has borderline top 100 prospect ability in the Yankee system. I mean, maybe he's more like a Massey or a Lofton who sits kind of on the outside of the top 100 for most of his minor league career. But you're talking about that kind of ability for a late first round pick. So 
Mason was way out ahead of the curve on Trey Sweeney. Really good at finding players in that way. So I'm really excited, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts on on your expectations. Yeah, I mean, it's two dudes that that know where to find the information, where to what information is the most valuable, uh, and then how to apply that information. So it's it's you know we got player development within each organization, but like we're going to kind of focus on the MLB draft and that's not always the best place to have information. And these two guys have that information. So uh, it's, it's always interesting to see the viewpoints of the guys that are in the, in the mud, doing the development, doing the scouting and, uh, and putting their name on it. So uh, I'm, I'm jacked to see what they kind of think about this draft class for sure. Absolutely. We'll have more draft coverage as we go. And don't forget the RFR draft guide. The second Royals Farm Report draft guide will be out in July. Still working on that. We've got all kinds of reports, close to 100 reports already done. We will have a top 100. We will have our first mock and only mock draft. We will have kind of a a look at the system and where these guys can fit in. So it'll be really cool thinking about selling it around $3.99, right around that $4 mark. All of it will go to paying writers, to paying Josh and Joel and I for the podcast and investing that further into getting you guys more looks. So really excited to get that out to you. And here in a minute, we're going to be joined, like I said, by Kyle Bodie of Driveline Baseball. So we're going to throw to a quick ad break and we will be right back. All right, we are back. We are now joined by Kyle Bodie, the owner and founder of Driveline Baseball out in, well, are you guys still in Seattle? I know you opened up at least another branch in Phoenix, maybe during the pandemic, but are you still based out of Seattle? Yeah. Yeah. I'm in Seattle currently. Uh, We have a team in Phoenix. Uh, We actually wrapped up our small location there. It was kind of a test location uh, and we're procuring a larger one moving on with expanding to two full large sites, which is exciting. So I think a lot of Royals fans that are listening to this podcast specifically are probably at least vaguely familiar with you and with Driveline. But really quickly, if you can explain in 30 to 60 seconds, what Driveline started out as and how you brought an outsider's mind into the baseball business. How did that all get started for you? Yeah, Royals Royals and A's fans are like the two that propelled me. <laughs> They're like all my website <laughs> traffic. Uh, it's like Tyler Blazinski, who started Vox Media. You know, he started Athletics Nation uh, and then SB Nation, Athletics Nation, SB Nation, and then Vox Media. Then he bowed out. Uh, Tyler is the one that gave me my first chance, actually, on the SB Nation Network, which was cool. Um, basically, I, I was coaching. I moved from Cleveland to Seattle. I was a shitty baseball player, not really worth getting into. Um, and I wanted to coach and I wanted to help kids get better. And the biggest thing I wanted to do was make sure they didn't get hurt. And so I studied economics. I have a pretty scientific kind of mindset. My father worked at NASA for a little bit. And so that's really influenced how I think about things. And so I figured there must be a lot of research on how to keep pitchers healthy that wasn't being applied by coaches. Uh, it turns out there just isn't any of that. Coaches certainly aren't applying any information, but the information it wasn't available and it still really isn't. Uh, so that kind of was the beginning of like, well, if there isn't any information or data, um, I'm going to make a company and, and, and I'm going to generate that information and build a biomechanics lab and start from there. And that's the beginning of trouble, I guess. And so that's where driveline started and that's, it's, we're still there. We're still doing that. Nice. So you, you've got the background. You got the background of Kyle Bodie and Driveline, and where you're kind of you know, started, where you're headed. You know you've been involved with the Cincinnati Reds' uh, development um, and all that time to go. We're kind of focusing on the draft here lately. We've got it coming up here in a few weeks. So let's get your let's start off here at the potential do's and don'ts of any MLB club. Are there any like automatic do's and don'ts when it comes to the MLB draft? I love the draft. I mean, I, I want to get that clear. So. If that's what we're starting with, appearance is going to run over our time, so, which is totally fine. Totally fine by me. I love both the drafts, you know, the amateur drafts and the Rule Five drafts. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, Royals are one of the teams that scored one of the best Rule Five picks, of course, Brad Keller. Uh, so, one of the um, beauties of the draft, obviously, is you can dream on all these guys, right? And so, the automatic do's or don'ts is, I think, it's just you got to start with. So many of the teams start with the draft. And acquiring players generally internationally whatever um like we bring those players in and then they view them like that's the beginning of our decision making and that's just uh missing the forest for the trees i think you know you really have to figure out 
how you want to develop your players and what you're good at and what you're not good at. Uh, there's a lot of things that we were good at with the Reds, and there's some things we weren't good at when we were together. So always starting with what our coaches are good at and not even that question, because that question is kind of complicated. It's more like, what has our organization shown that it can do over the last 10 years? Um, you know, because if you don't start anywhere, you know, where the Royals kind of are at, you know, you got to just like take a hard look and be like, what are we good at? What are we not good at? So, for example, to, to steer away from the Royals a little bit, but your complex mate you can surprise the Rangers. You know, the Rangers have not, they've had equal success as the Royals is developing starting pitching, which is to say none. You know, um, <laughs> the success is an interesting word to use there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you can't really be taking with your top picks, high school pitchers, especially. You know, so the Rangers recently selected a player and paid him first round money, even though he was a second or third rounder, Dylan McLean. Now, Dylan McLean is a fine high school draft pick, maybe a first rounder, kind of a stretch for the money, but he's left handed, really good extension, really good components, great spin rate, great changeup, great slider. Like everything is there to make him project that he could be a really good player um, at one point four, one point six million dollars. Very smart kid, very committed to college. Was going to go, um, so you got to pay pretty good money to get him away. But the problem is that Dylan McLean throws eighty six, right? So like that's not going to cut it, you know. Uh, but that's okay as long as you have a history of developing players and getting them to throw harder because. 86 isn't going to cut it. And 90s, we're not going to cut it, you know. But here we are three years later, and Dylan McLean is throwing 85 in, in a ball and getting killed. Um, that's just a very – that mistake can't happen. It's bad. It's a very bad decision, you know. And I have friends of the Rangers. You know, I love those guys. But, like, that just makes no sense. You know, they, they didn't start with the end, right? Like, what? where do we start with? Like, what is this player looking in the big leagues, and what does he got to do to get there? So when you take someone like Hunter Green, the Hunter needed to be coached. I'm not trying to say we didn't coach him, but like it's not that hard to coach Hunter. He's a great kid, super strong work ethic, and he's driven like almost no one I've ever met. Right? He has he has that dog in him. I mean, to use that term. And we made some changes. I think Hunter would say that he he got better, you know. Uh, but and he's continuing to get better because he is a coachable kid. But it's not that hard to coach a kid that sits 102, you know, yeah. with <laughs> that throws all strikes. Yeah. You know, it has a not max effort delivery. I mean, he can throw 104 any anytime he wants. Anytime. Yeah. I watch him do it. You know, so when he sits 100, everyone's like, oh, it's not good for him. I'm like, look, he can't, his first warm up pitches on Trackman are 92. So, like, the second baseman catching back there. Like, he just can't throw a ball slow. So, it's not that tough. You know, now when you go all the way down to a non drafted free agent like a Carson Spires, you know, who I really liked when we got him. You know, we, you have to, he has to get a hell of a lot better because he was throwing 88 at Clemson and was a closer. And we're going to convert, convert him to starter. And he's 22, 23 years old. And he's got to get moving. That's a challenge, right? So not to, it's already been a long winded point, but like you have to start with what your organization can develop and what they can't. And then if they can't develop it, they should draft present skills. And if they can develop it, then you can start being more speculative. And I think the best way to look at that overall is to look at what Tampa Bay and the Baltimore Orioles and really the Houston Astros have done, you know, Sig Medal and Lunau, also, also with the Cardinals, um, you know, when they were there and their draft picks are heavily biased towards hitters and not pitchers. And there's like a lot of reasons for that, but uh, we can get into more of it, but just like look what the successful organizations do. Obviously success leaves clues, but you got to start with the end. Like they're going to, you want them to be a big leaguer. So like, what have we done to develop big leaguers and what are we good at? Are we good at anything? You know, and, um, yeah, the answer is, is generally yes, we're good at something. You know, so yeah. like what aren't we good at? And then we can't, if we're the Rockies, we can't take Riley Pine. We can't take high school pitchers. It's, you can't do that because like they don't develop starters. And yeah, there should be something to be said that they should get better at develop pitching. Um, we can get into that. I know we will. Right. But like if you can at least admit to yourself that you can't take a high school pitcher, you just can't do that. Yeah. Pretty good segue into kind of what I wanted to get into next is it relates to the draft and player development. Is it possible to out scout bad development or to out develop bad scouting? Because I think with the Royals in in 2018, you draft an entire class of college pitchers. It's almost kind of like, hey, we don't have a ton of pitching in the system at present. We haven't gotten the guys we have drafted where we want them to be. So we're going to draft a ton of college kids 
And not that in some way they were admitting to developmental flaws, but if we can out scout those flaws, maybe we can get a rotation full of big leaguers out of these college arms. Or is it possible to outdevelop bad scouting where you go into development and you know the org brings you 12 arms and you and you look at them and say, man, you didn't bring me the fastball shapes I needed, or two guys who don't they don't tunnel their stuff well. So we're gonna have to do a lot of development. I mean, is it possible to outrun one or the other? And I guess if it is possible, which is easier to do? I think that's a really good question. Um, I think it's getting harder every year to do that. I think that the answer is probably not no. You know, probably you can to some degree, but for all the bitching everyone does about how bad the hitting is in the big leagues, and I'll certainly agree with that. The hitting is getting shameful. It's bad. But <laughs> that's really more of a function of the pitching getting so much better, you know, than it is the hit. The hitters are really good. It's just that the pitching and specifically the defense has gotten so much better than people imagine. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that like Jeremy Giambi would play the outfield. And so, you know, rest in peace. You know, but like, like Billy Butler is just like getting uh, reps anywhere. It's insane. Yeah. You know, like when I was like huge Indians Guardians fans watching Billy Butler play, it's like, yeah, come on. Like it's, you know, Billy Butler hits 800 versus Cleveland and it's still, or like, like I'm old enough to remember like Mike Sweeney playing the field. It's like, that's terrible. It just can't happen, you know? And, like, and it doesn't happen today, right? Like Mike Sweeney used to catch, and you guys are all too yeah. young to yep. remember that. But like, it was embarrassing, you know? Um, like if you watch 80s games, you know, like the one thing you should notice immediately is how bad the catch is. It's so bad. It's like everyone's yeah. awful and then there's Brad Ospis. It's like, <laughs> that's that's it. You know, Brad Ospis could catch today. He's that good, you know? And now the defense has gotten so much better. So like balls and players just outs, you know, like it's crazy. Uh, so I guess what I'm saying is, is that because, so because, so that masks the fact that the hitters are that good. And what I mean by that is like, if your pitcher has a lot of flaws or like very exposable flaws, they never even get to the big leagues these days because the hitting is that good. It just doesn't look like it in the big leagues because the pitchers have, have, have outpaced them, you know, but that's not, that's not going to continue. Like the Yankees are showing that you can develop hitting, the, that the Dodgers, I mean, it's all the usual people, obviously, that are developing the best hitting and drafting the right players. Um, you know, it's just, but like you're seeing it, like there's more teams that are going to hit, uh, not exactly like the Yankees, but you're going to see like, you know, pr pretty good, pretty good hitting. So the results so of my point is, is that to have big glaring flaws, it's tough. Like, yeah, you might be able to turn over the Rockies lineup or the Royals lineup a couple of times, you know, but, um, it's tough. I mean, even the Royals, like when we would play them in AAA in Omaha, I mean, that lineup is really good. So they're not big leaguers, obviously, you know, but it sucks to face like seven guys in Omaha that are like pretty close to being big leaguers, you know, and then Vinny Pascantino. You know, it's just sucks when I was in Louisville, just like having to see that. Um, so the point is, is that like the hitters are a lot better than I think people give them credit for. So I don't think you really can, you know, maybe for a limited time, you can't out scatter, you can't out develop. Uh, but forward looking, I think that would be a really foolish plan. Well, that, I mean, kind of along the same lines as we've, and we've, we've kind of touched on both of this is just the, the ability to capture and gather information and kind of use that towards developing guys or scouting other players or what have you with that. But um, in this kind of relative to this draft coming up, is there a, a good indicator that, um, you know, between prep arms and uh, like high school arms or, or college arms or what have you, is there one good piece of information that you look for um, that would help you kind of, be a good indicator as to how good a kid can be. Yeah, high school's a interesting. It's a prep is in a really interesting spot in the draft these days. Um, kind of really quickly go back to the out scout out development thing because I just thought about it. When we would play, I think the fastest average velocity of pitchers in the minors, at least it felt like it. It's definitely in the top three, but I think it's number one was Quad Cities, was the Royals Quad Cities team. And we would play them and they won like a zillion games and my team was insane. And it just sucks to face like, you know, those pitchers. It sucks because they're all really good. And, um, but the difference was with Dayton, you know, uh, the Dayton Dragons. So it's one of my, the team that I was in control of. Um, the Royals do a lot of things really well in the minors, which is like why I always wanted to play them in, the, in spring training. Like they hold runners really well. They steal a lot. They're super aggressive. Like it, those are all things that sound like cliche to fans, but they're really important to develop minor league players. Like the Yankees don't hold runners in the minors. It's embarrassing. You know, like they're, I think they have the highest stolen against rate. They don't care about stolen bases. It's their philosophy. 
it's fine. I really don't agree with it, but whatever, it's fine. Like with the Reds, we were very, very adamant that we were going to hold runners and do the little things. And that's what I like about the Royals a lot because they do care about that stuff. And that stuff does matter. It makes the game watchable. When guys are like two seconds to home plate, you guys are walking into pool holes and stealing. It's not fun to watch for any fan. It's stupid. You know, it's like, that's not baseball. You know, some guy's mm-hmm. trying to throw one mile an hour harder or like optimize a slider and he's not paying attention to the game. And maybe that's the right thing to do. Maybe it is. I don't agree, think it is, but maybe it is. Um, but that sucks. That's not watchable. Right. Like that's, that's, that's very frustrating. So point is, is like, I love watching the Royals play. Um, baseball and I always wanted to play against them because they're really aggressive and I think they made our pitchers better. Mm-hmm. But what I will say is that when you draft players, it, like when the Royals got Asalisi, it was like, it was insane. Like that's a really, he should not be available in the Royals pick. You know, it's like it's very, very, very good draft pick, very lucky. But the, to, you know, credit to them to take him because like that, that is the best player. Um, but then we crushed Lacey. Like he pitched twice against us. He pitched on Tuesday, Sunday. And on Tuesday, we destroyed him. And he was sitting 97 to 99, like 23 inches of carry and a slider that's just disgusting. And we didn't walk a lot of guys. He walks some because he doesn't have the best command. But I mean, our hitters hit. They raked, you know. Uh, and that should never happen. And the reason is, is that Lacey, we didn't hit him. Lacey hit, the, hit our bats. You know, and like, so that's, that's not a good sign, right? It's like you took a guy <laughs> with two plus, 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 plus pitches and like you're turning into a professional, professional barrel hitter, you know, which is like, that's, there's something that has to change. And maybe, you know, I don't know Lacey, so maybe there's something there, but the point is, is like when I watched him pitch now to his credit, when he came out the next time, he punches all out. It was really good, you know, but like that should not happen at A ball. Lacey should be able to get everyone out of A ball very easily, you know, and then when he went to double A, it's pretty clear that he can't. You know, and his slider is in a spot where even if you had access to like driveline tools or like advanced tools, you would think that Lisey's slide, like a scout would put like a 65 or maybe even a 70 on Lisey's slider, like the pitches plus to plus plus near a generational pitch. It's really good. But if you put it through like a naive analysis, like a stuff plus model, it doesn't get graded that well often. Like a lot of models will grade it poorly. Ours doesn't. Um, but like, it's easy to grade it. I'm not saying ours is better as a result, but like, it's easy to grade it poorly because it's a gyro ball. It doesn't have a lot of movement. You know, it doesn't look aesthetically pleasing when you watch it. It doesn't, you know, uh, but the difference is that when Lacey was drafted, he threw his slider 90 miles an hour. No one does that. And he's left-handed, you know, like that's, that's, that's what matters. And in their pitch data, you can see that Lacey throws a slider less, you know, fewer and fewer times. And that's, that's a not communication thing, right? Like the player development either believes this thing, you know, which they are number one in change up rate in the minors. Um, and they believe they throw a lot of fastballs and change ups. When you just look at the data, I don't know exactly what the Royals believe, but you can watch the data doesn't lie, right? And then you draft players who are slider heavy. Another guy, the reason I'm really saying this isn't about Lacey, it's about a guy named Christian Chamberlain, who mm-hmm. I want a lot at Oregon State. And Chamberlain is a type of pitcher who's like Josh Hader, where Chamberlain has a mismatched slider profile or breaking ball profile for his arm slot. Whereas like, it looks like Chamberlain throws almost sidearm, you know? And then when you see that, you expect a breaking ball, like a big sweeper. And that's true. Like it's the reverse of Hader, right? Hader throws a big sweeping breaking ball, but a nearly perfectly backspun fastball. Right, which is very weird for people to face. And Chamberlain throws a big sweeping fastball, but he throws a basically a near 12 6 curveball, which is really strange, you know. Mm-hmm. And then, like, they don't, what I'm getting at is they don't use him in a way that makes kind of sense. Like, they, they don't use him in a way that, like, maximizes the weirdness of him. Yeah. Uh, it's possible that they're not aware of it, you know, but like that, those types of things are. You know, every once in a while, Christian will put sequences together where our hitters are just like, I didn't see a single pitch. I didn't see one. Two or four pitches, I didn't see a fucking one of them. I, I, even if I was in a swing, I don't even know where I would have seen yeah. I don't know if he threw four fastballs. I don't know if he threw four breaking balls. You know, like, and that's, uh, you know, that happens because he has that deception factor. Um, so the point is, is like, not to hammer the Royals. I'm sure we'll do more of that. But the point is, is like, that's what happens when you don't have that communication. And either it's a lack of information, which I'm sure is part of it, 
But then there's also just like that lack of communication is um, mm. very, very frustrating. And as speaking yeah. as someone who's been in that position, um, yeah, I never had a bad experience with the Reds. We, ours was awesome. You know, our communication, it was insane. It was a joke how good it was. So like, we were able to maximize our uh, strengths. And even if the scouts didn't believe me or agree with me and we had some arguments, that's totally part of it. Uh, but at the end of the day, like they picked the players, I developed them, and we understood our boundaries. Yeah, but our communication was 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 really good, and so it's yeah. frustrating. You know that that's not the case everywhere else. <laughs> that reminds me, you you interacted with Seth. His Twitter account is like the Platinum Sombrero or something, and I saw you interact oh, with him the other day. Yeah, he, guys so got a great Twitter. Yeah, yeah he has got a great account. And he tweeted the other day. He was, I think, he was making fun of Cal Elder. But what he said was, he's like. Maybe Lonnie Goldberg is actually the only person in the organization doing his job, and it's the development that, that's falling. And Seth was joking, but I think to the point, like it's possible that I think a lot of Royals fans get really frustrated with with the scouting. They get frustrated with Lonnie Goldberg, and they and they look at it and they go, "Well, we're clearly not drafting the right guys because they're not succeeding." And I think what we can take away, at least from the from the Chamberlain profile that you gave, is the the, the concept, the idea that. It's possible that the scouting looks at a player like Chamberlain, and, and, and I'm not going to give them credit and say they looked exactly like what you were talking about, and they knew exactly what they were doing when they drafted it. But let's just say they were. It's possible you draft a guy like Chamberlain, have these plans in place, and then they get to development, and all of a sudden it's it's not matching. So, so how you mentioned that there are good communicators and bad communicators in terms of scouting and development, but walk us through how tough it is because let's say you draft a guy like Chamberlain and we don't have to keep using him as an example, but you brought him up and I think it's a really good point where John Heasley's pitching last night and he, he you know, Saris wrote an article about how good Heasley's slider is and he should throw the slider more. So scouting, something is telling you, Hey, we should do these things more and development's like, no, we're going to do this more. Even though the scouts who are in charge of adding the players to the system or adding them for a specific reason, and then if development does something entirely else, like how hard is it to bridge that gap? Because clearly, in some organizations, there is a gap there that pitchers are missing out on their most optimal form because what the scouts saw is not being put into place by development. Yeah, that um, sad to say that happens a lot. You know, it's uh, it's um, it might be most prevalent on hitters, which is super funny uh, to think about, but there's like this big debate. I don't know why it's a debate, but there is in player development of like bat speed matters. Uh, like bat speed is like, oh, it's not everything and barrel contact is more important or whatever. Um, you know, there's there's the big three we call it a drive line, right? There's, you know, barrel percentage, contact quality, and bat speed. But bat speed explains like the vast majority of uh, success for hitters. It's like fastball velocity. And for a long time, I didn't necessarily know if I believed it because I felt hitting was more complicated than that. And it is, but still just like pitching is more complicated than throwing hundred miles an hour. Like it still explains a large percentage of like success and scouts have known that forever. They've known that for decades, like scouts highly prized bat speed. You don't draft Melendez, you know, the current one that you have or the next one with the Ranger with the, with Texas, if you don't think bat speed is important, you know, but MJ Melendez has ridiculous bat speed, right? So does Bobby Witt. So did, um, you know, so did Hoch, uh, so did Moustakis, and so did um, Bo Sarling, right? Like these players had elite bat speed. Um, doesn't mean they're always going to work out, obviously, right? But the scouts know it. They've known it forever. And in player development, they don't agree or there's a debate. It's ridiculous. Like someone has to like be wrong or like there has to be communication about it. So, Kind of just doesn't make any sense, you know. Like, like, and so when you think about who the players, have, who the Royals have drafted as hitters, like, think about it, right? It's so it's first of all, it's Kyle Zimmer who had elite bats when he was a hitter, but with Starling, Hunter Dozier, uh, like Chase Vallot, uh, probably true. I think who else they've drafted since then? Uh, Nick Prado, ridiculous bat speed. Um, yeah, and so it's just like they, the Royals prize tools, which is kind of a known thing. Um, it's hard to hard to imagine that there's like that big of a disconnect. And then the, to go to the pitching side, all three of these players in the big leagues are up and down, right? And so you see Brady Singer, Jackson Kohar, and Lynch. Like Singer was a favorite. Singer possibly could have gone one one until he had the year he had, right? Like he was a, going into the year potentially being their first overall pick. And it's not like Singer had a terrible year. It was just one that like 
reduced him to moving further down because there were injury concerns and a lot of those things ended up happening. Um, but no, I would be shocked. I don't remember anyone in 2018 like shitting on those picks. You know, in fact, like Coar is a bit of an overdraft, what people thought. But I thought Coar, in my opinion, I thought Coar was better than Singer because Coar, not at the same money in the slot, but Coar would easily cost less, like because he didn't have a very good year. He pitched on Sundays and so forth. Uh, so when they drafted Coar, I was like, that's a nice pick, you know, because that's a pretty underrated player, I think. Um, and Lynch didn't have a great college career, but was very obviously a top 50 pick. You know, he was a big high school draft pick. Mm-hmm. Um, so none of those are bad draft picks. I would be shocked if you could like grade those as bad draft picks. Like I, I wouldn't. You know, so then you look and they're all in the big leagues, which is great, right? But none of them have accomplished I think what people would expect them to. And I think they would say the same thing. Um, and that's the same that's true about Chris Bubik too, you know. And that's the frustrating thing. Like what's going on, like when all of these players when you draft a lot of college pitchers in the first round and they don't work out, that's not good you know like when ash russell and so forth like kyle zimmer is like whatever kyle is a very good friend of mine and we train him and that story is very well known right but like what kyle went through is insane like all the injuries that he went through are absurd and like not the world's fault at all and kyle would say that right kyle would never blame the royals you know and in fact kyle says the royals what dayton and those guys are good at is that they never give up kyle they never fucking give up on him you know which is like that's where the royals strength is you know, whether it's from Dayton Moore publicly repudiating Manfred in the media, talking about like how the Mayor League contraction is bad for baseball and Dayton is crying on live TV. I mean, that means a lot. Like, I don't, I don't like take that like uh, lightly. Like, I, I really respect Dayton for doing things like that. And then when we had the non drafted free agency period in the COVID draft, the Royals signed five of the best six, six, five of the six best players. And it's not like it, it's not it's not a, a shock why right because mm-hmm. the Royals does have great relationships with people and and the players and the agents know that the Royals take care of their players you know like do they develop them like you know the answer is not great there you know but like that's not usually what they think about what they think about is like how do they treat the players do they cut them ruthlessly and like Dayton doesn't do that and he's very very player friendly. Um, the problem is, is like, that's not how you run a business, right? There needs to be a balance. And that's the frustrating thing that you're seeing in the draft and, and the loyalty to people that aren't getting results. And at the end of the day, like, this is a business. It's not a club. You know, it's not a friendship club. Um, there's, there's one winner and 29 losers every year. And like, that's how you gotta, that's how you gotta act. Like, that's just true. If you're evaluating the draft and you're looking at your system in a way, to okay so to use the draft to better your system by position you're like hey we don't have a lot of this we can get it in the draft is there an appropriate time for that or do you believe you buy into the idea of best player available because i think a lot of people and self-included have tried to remind the casual fan that look you can't it's not like the chiefs drafting george karloftis he's going to start a defensive end this year as a rookie because we need a defensive end we can't so you draft the best player available regardless of position, and then we will figure something out later. Is there a time and a place for that in the draft, or do you believe that you have to stick by the board, the guys you, of traits that you like, guys we know we can develop, or is there a time where like the Angels draft 20 of their 21 pick for the pitchers or something? That's <laughs> so stupid. You're Overcorrect. <laughs> hold, hold podcast of that. The best part about that, by far the best part is that their first rounder is like a pretty big stretch to be drafted and is hurt. So I don't want to like, but like also wasn't good when he was healthy. <laughs> and then the angels drafted 20 pitchers and signed, I think six non-drafted pitchers too, you know, and they are still in the bottom half of XCR and the minor leagues. Like that's absurd. The, the Orioles drafted no pitchers, I think in 20 rounds or two or one, yeah. you know, and they are like fifth in XCR. So I guess that answers the question, which is that I don't believe in the best player available. Like you got to really convince me to sign you as a pitcher. Like I just don't think we should draft pitchers. Generally, um, we're really good at developing them. And pitchers, I think if you look at the distribution of pitchers that contribute at the big league level, it's much wider than hitters. You know, the hitters tend to be mostly first to third to fifth round. You that's the bulk of the value. You know, and the pitchers are kind of all over the place. Yeah, there's the Verlanders and Crankies and so forth that are all first rounders, 
But there's a lot of value being generated by guys that are like low. And I think the Astros are probably a really good example of that with Framber Valdez, Christian, um, Javier, um, uh, Luis Garcia, and a bunch of others, you know, that are really, um, really impactful players that signed for $100,000 or less. Javier is the high bonus guy out of that, and he signed for 100 k The rest of the guys signed for less, you know, and they contributed. Now, did they win the World Series? No. Right. But like, did they, were they, any team that loses Verlander and Greenkey should just like pack it in. Right. Like, and yet they were still in the World Series like, and competitive, you know. Um, so that's pretty cool to watch. Uh, so to me, no, I, I think you got to draft players that make the most sense for your organization. You also have to really factor in um, the Rule 5 draft has a really big impact on the roster construction, but it's very invisible because teams don't get got by the Rule 5 anymore. They used to, like Johan Santana. Famously, the Pirates under Dave Littlefield is like one of the worst ever, where they lost four players in the Rule 5 draft, and then they drafted no players. Like, that that would be insane today. Like, they lost, like, Xavier Nady and, like, I think three other players, which is just ridiculous. You know, like, the GMs don't, like, like just don't do anything these days. You know, they, they know enough to not like do things like that. Um, so the rule, the pressure of the rule five in these is like, you, you do need to stagger your draft classes because if you draft only college players, then they all hit free agency at the same time. They all hit free agency faster. Mm-hmm. So you need to stagger your clock. So it's actually a logistics problem. You know, like the, ideally you have someone on your staff who knows a little bit about baseball, but primarily knows a lot about process management and logistics and the Dodgers had probably the best guy in the world to do that. And it was Doug Fearing and um, positional flexibility and roster construction was Fearing's like uh, number one thing he was good at. And I think you can see that as evidenced by how the Dodgers kind of, yeah, they have a lot of really good players, but how they manage their structure allows them to have the most homegrown players. And yes, they have a huge payroll, right? But like the way that they do it, I think is much more sustainable. Um, and uh, on a lesser scale, Tampa Bay does a really good job. And so does Cleveland. Uh, so you watch like, you need to be able to, when the player is so good in your model and you believe so solidly, you have to do it. And that was Cleveland with Daniel Espino. Like they just believed that Espino, you know, they're not an organization that necessarily really wants to draft a pitcher like that high because they really have a lot of faith in their pitching development, which they should. But when Espino is available at 17 years old and they, they believe Espino is every bit as good as any other pitcher in the world, then you don't really have a choice. Like you have to, you really do believe that player is so much better. Um, I think they're they're pretty right. They got a lot of shit for it at the time, but I had to watch Espino mow us down in Lake County, and it was not fun to watch. Um, and that's every bit as good. And then the Rays are another good example of that. They're, they don't draft pitchers generally very high, like they don't do that. And yet, when Shane McClanahan fell to them, they were just like, "Okay, what's wrong here? He's left-handed, and there's a hundred. Like, yeah. uh, we just like not care about this anymore, right? Like we overcorrected for left-handedness. You know, we overdrafted left-handers and we underdrafted them." You know, the Royals don't draft left-handers, or I'm sorry, the, the Astros, you know, so then it's like the Rays are like, okay, well, like, we're just going to give us a lefty that throws 100 in the 28th pick we're going to take. You know, like, normally they would never, they just, their model is like, he won't be available, so they don't consider it. So yeah. then when he gets there, they're like, oh, well, all right, I guess we'll take him. You know, like, you don't have a choice. So uh, most of the time, they, I think you should have a target and a bias. And, and my personal one is to agree with, like, what Baltimore and those teams do, which is to, to, to really bias yourself towards the best college and prep hitters. Um, because frankly speaking, we know more about developing pitchers than we do hitters at this moment. That's one thing that I think is interesting about the Royals, and we'll and we'll wrap up here in just a second. I know I, I know you're busy. The Royals recently, with Drew Saylor and Alex Umwalt, have been really good at getting their hitters back on track. They've done a better job at developing their offensive players. Michael Massey appears to be a big league caliber player now. Vinny Pasquantino went from 11th round pick to top 100 prospect. And yet last year they drafted prep arms early in the draft and they did it in 2020 with Ben Hernandez in the second round. And it's, you know, it kind of goes back to that, the the idea of can you out scout bad development? Like if we can develop hitters, we'll take hitters late and pitchers early because I agree with you. I think taking prep pitchers early in the draft is a sucker's bet. And I, for the life of me, don't think I would invest three of my top four picks in prep arms. But at the same time, it seems like the Royals in some, in some way have have gone to that route. So the, I guess the one thing I'm, I, I would ask is, is there is there any one stat that you in a prep arm that you would look at and go, OK, this this specific metric, this specific number, this stat, this reading, whatever is if we get to a certain point, if we can put a 60 or a 70 
at this specific thing for this prep arm that that levitates that pitcher above a myriad of subpar ratings like does does that one thing exist does that question make sense yes it absolutely exists for prep arms and it's unique to prep arms are you ready for it yeah it is their bonus demands <laughs> <laughs> the bonus demands of prep arms has gotten absurd <laughs> like it's absurd and fine it's fine you're allowed to say whatever you want you know but like they don't I, so I want two million dollars right-handed that there's 89 miles an hour and I'm committed to school. I don't want to go. I have a 2.4 GPA. It's like, well, why do we even have to have this conversation, man? You know, like this is ridiculous. You know, you don't even know what like two million paper clips look like, you know, much less, <laughs> you know, it's just so now the pressure has increased because of the NIL thing in college, and that's good in my opinion. I think it's great. Um, kids going to school is by and large a good thing, but the media tends to make it out to be that like, oh, most of the, you see those graphics on MLB tonight, like most of the players went to college, you know, in the big leagues. There's a big selection bias there, obviously. Um, but there's, they don't like to talk about the players who got offered a million dollars. Like ask Karsten Whitson how he feels about it. Like Karsten Whitson turned down one point, whatever, and then never threw an inning for Florida and then like never played pro ball. You know, it's like, that's, you like, do we want to have that discussion? My friend, Joel McKeithen, who's the big league assistant coach for the Cincinnati Reds on the hitting side, turned down 700 K. He was rated the best defensive shortstop in, in prep in his class and his class included Manny Machado. And that guy played at Vanderbilt and never played affiliate ball. Like we guess we don't talk about that, right? Like those, like the college doesn't work out for everyone. Um, so it depends on the person. It depends on the mentality of it. Um, but I think the best players, the best prep arms will probably go to school now, which I think is good because Texas A&M and LSU are paying a lot of money to go to school to play ball, which is great. I have nothing wrong with that. Hmm. Uh, but yeah, you have a chance, I think, if you're like a prep arm that's like you're going to go to a junior college or you want to develop. And I think this is the big market inefficiency. And you like um, you don't really like school, you know, but you really want to play baseball, but you don't know what to do. Um, and you're willing to take, like, I'm not saying you should sign for nothing, but if you're willing to sign for like 600,000 to a million, there's a lot of players that I think that could fit that band that make demands that are like 1.4 million saying that they would, you know, internally, I think they would settle for less, but then scouts just don't waste their time anymore. Like they just don't talk like, ah, it's another kid with an agent who says some huge number and I'm not wasting my time, you know, and I, that happens a lot. And these kids end up making some often bad decisions. As a result of that, that's very frustrating because I don't like seeing that, um, you know, because a kid, if you're a high school kid, you have all the leverage in the world to go to the team that you want, right? So if a team drafts you and you don't like their pitching development, all right, deuces, I'm going to junior college. I'm going to yeah. four-year school, right? Like, so you have you have the chance to, that's the only chance you have to steer yourself. You know, junior college a little bit, right? But in high school, you have a chance to be drafted by the team you want and sign for a member that's comfortable for both teams, um, but you lose that leverage as soon as you leave high school. I don't think a lot of kids are getting that message, which is frustrating. And, and I agree that most kids aren't ready to play professional baseball at 18 years old. It's a very harsh world out there, but some of them are, right? Not a lot of kids are ready to go to school either. And we push them into that, you know, so um, I, not to, it's gone long, you know, um, and I have time, so it's totally fine to keep going. Point is, is that like the metric is that uh, I think the kids have to be honest with themselves and the teams have to be honest with themselves. Like, does the kid really want to play baseball? Like, is this really what you want to do? Do you, are you really like a baseball guy or like, are you using this to like drive up your bonus level to go to school and whatever? And that, that's all fine. I think you just got to be a little more honest with the teams. Uh, Cause they don't, these kids t tend to say numbers that like don't make a lot of sense. You know, when you can draft, uh, you know, way better college players for a lot less money, you really don't have a lot of business. Like when you throw 87 miles an hour, and you're demanding $2 million. It's like, it feels like you don't watch baseball on TV. You know, it feels like you don't like. It feels like uh, you're not paying attention to like what else is available, and that's very frustrating to me to watch because I think ultimately the kids lose out in the end. You know, I don't think kids should take less money. I don't. I think Hunter Green should have signed for five times the amount of money that he signed for. Um, you know, but that's not how it works. So I'm all about people getting the best opportunity and the most money. But when you have kids that are like very disconnected from the value that 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 the rest of the industry sees them at, that's only harmful for the kids. So, yeah, so that sucks. Last question, we'll get you out of here. As the Royals sit here with the ninth overall pick uh, coming up in the July draft, 
Is there anybody that you've seen on the board? I think for me personally, the guy is Jace Young, who hit at every level, appears to be a good athlete. Maybe he's not the premium defender that you would want at second base, but I think he's a good enough athlete to to learn and to hold it down. Is there anybody that you've seen on the board at number nine that maybe in mock drafts have continued to pass over the Royals at that spot that you would take? Or is there anybody that you're just a really big fan of for the Royals at number nine? I mean, the the obvious one that every Royals fan worth their salt, and I think every Royals employee, including one specifically, really wants to fall as Cam Collier. Uh, you know, since his dad and all that. But uh, Cam, I've tweeted about him a lot. I don't know him. I just that that's a very um, it's hard it's hard to describe how unique Cam is because that's not. You know, who leaves their junior year of high school to then go play junior college ball? Like the names are like Jeremy Bonderman, Bryce Harper, really. Like, I think Bobby Jenks. You know, it's like not too many other people I can think of. You know, and Cam is, and, and he didn't go to any JUCO, right? He went to the best junior college in the country. And he breaks and yeah. to start, he made the team when he was sixteen. You got to imagine that. Like he's seventeen now, but to make the team in the fall and beat out all the Florida State kickbacks. He was 60 and a half years old and the coach at Chipola, who does not care that he's like, you know, call your son. He's not going to do a favor for him. You know, he's just going to play the best nine and Cam is one of the best nine. That is crazy. You know, so it'd be awesome if Cam got to them. I don't think he's going to, um, which is frustrating, uh, I think, for everyone. But uh, not for Cam, I'm sure. But, uh, you know, he'll get, he'll get more money. <laughs> he doesn't get there. Uh, I think an interesting one kind of a dark horse where you can save money and then sign a high school kid later, as we were talking about, um, it's probably Chase the Water from uh, James Madison. Um, you know, one of the, be- arguably one of the, arguably the best college hitter in the class. Statistically, obviously he got hurt and that really crushed his value. He's also, I think, a senior or he's an old junior. Uh, so as a result, his draft bonus is going to be a little lower. He played in a mid-major, so that, that affects his status. Um, so I think the Water is an interesting guy that if you want to go under slot and go there. Um, it'd be really hard to go against Chase Young. Obviously, the knock is that he plays second. He doesn't play short. Um, yeah, Jacob Berry is a good one, but like, where's Jacob going to play? I think this is a good question. Um, I think Kevin Parada is really good. Uh, you know, if you want to draft a catcher, uh, I think that that's a really good choice. So I think there's a lot of really good options. Um, the pitching is, uh, Interesting. I don't think there's a lot of bad choices for pitching. I hope, I mean, not hope, it's not my team, but uh, the, it, the Royals picking the pitcher at that slot, I think, would be kind of crazy since it's a big overdraft. I don't think there's a pitcher, you know, like unless you're going to go with an upside like Prelip, probably from Alabama, um, which I think would be a huge overdraft at that slot um, since he needs Tommy John or has had it and needs to re- rehab. Um, so I don't know about that. Or uh, Prelip, Prelip is back. He's throwing, I forgot. But still, you know, he's not going to pitch this year probably. Um, you know, and then the best college pitcher probably is a pretty weird one. You know, he trains at driveline, so I'm not going to, like, you know, shit on him <laughs> at all. But it's, it's, it's an interesting profile, right, where Cooper Kirby from Oregon State is, is the best college pitcher. But you got to be pretty sure, like, what you're doing when you take Kirby because, you, like, I think you got to be a pretty advanced organization because Kirby's value is in – the deception, you know, his command, his uniqueness, right? He doesn't throw it in 100, right? But you can't argue he set the Oregon State strikeout record, right? And the Pac-12 uh, third strikeouts or whatever, you know, behind some legendary players. So, like, that's pretty pretty good, but the way Hirpy does it is, like, pretty different. So he's probably yeah. best off going to, like, the Guardians or whatever, you know, um, where they can maximize his value. So I think Jace is an awesome pick. You know, that that's obviously – that's obviously a big one, but I think there's some calls like Jace, Daniel Susak, Parade if he's available. Uh, the lottery would be like super exciting. And then Cam Collier, like I, if Cam's available, you can just have to take him. And I don't think the Royals would not take him. I think yeah. it just makes too much sense. So it's kind of a mix. Gavin Cross of Virginia Tech, obviously is, is huge. Um, uh, if I was going to take an outfielder, probably be more along the lines of the lottery and then like try to try to save money for a uh, high school arm or junior college arm. I'm glad you said that. Cause I've been, like almost like questioning myself for thinking that the lotter should still be in play there at number nine. And, you know, we were big on him and Collier preseason and thinking both these guys are definitely going to be available in some capacity. And then all of a sudden Collier plays himself out of number nine in, in a good way and the lotter gets hurt. And so I was sitting there thinking, man, two of my favorite bats in the draft class have now 
for one reason or another, played their way out of being available at number nine. So I was kind of doing some um, look in. I think I've, I've I've gotten in on the Jet Williams train. I really like Jet Williams, uh, prep shortstop, maybe a center fielder. So I think there's there's a lot of really good things the Royals can do, and I'm I'm really looking forward to it. Kyle, thank you very much for joining us. I have yeah. followed you on Twitter for a long time. I love a lot of the work you do. And I think I, I had Tommy John myself as a junior in high school for a lot of the same reasons as, you know, my coaches didn't know better. I would do a lot of the things you probably weren't supposed to do. And so I have been, you know, I don't, I, I coach now, albeit with, you know, a, a smaller capacity. Right. And so, uh, a big goal of mine is to do what I can to keep, help keep kids healthy and be as informed as I can be. And the best way to do that is is through the research done at Driveline, whether it's the blogs or the resources you guys put out. So um, I know I can speak on the behalf of coaches everywhere that thank you for for what you've been doing. A for the entertainment in terms of the baseball coverage, but B on the on the side of coaching. There's been a lot of really good stuff put out. So thank you Thanks. for your time today. This, this side of this side of free agency, I've been a lot more vocal as as, you, as the world's fans have noticed over the last week. <laughs> so it's just been uh, just decided that just decided to get back to a little bit of my old ways. So yeah, you, can, you can that'll that'll exist until I become an AGM. So maybe never. So maybe I'll just always be this way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate it. Thanks again, man. All right, see you guys. Looking for the best selection of Royals tickets? Be sure to check out my friends over at Tickets for Less. Ticketsforless.com. You'll find the best selection of Royals tickets at the best prices. You'll never pay outrageous per ticket service fees like you do on the other sites out there. Plus, use our exclusive partner code to save even more money on your tickets. Simply use promo code KCSN22 at Ticketsforless.com to save on any Royals ticket order. That code again is KCSN22. Memories for life start at Ticketsforless.com. All right, we are now joined by Mason McRae. Mason is my favorite draft analytics follow on Twitter. What is your Twitter handle, Mason? Uh, it is Mason underscore McRae. It's literally my name with an okay. underscore. So Mason underscore McRae. If you're not following Mason on Twitter, please do. Mason, two years ago, came on the podcast and told us all about Dylan Cruz. Dylan Cruz was a middling first round ish on draft boards type of prep outfielder ended up going to LSU and is almost definitely going to be the number one overall pick in next year's MLB draft. Last year, Mason came on the show and told us about Trey Sweeney, who was at Indiana state. Uh, Eastern like Illinois, pretty much. Eastern Illinois. Okay. So a mid-major D one school ended up going like 20 for fourth overall to the Yankees. And is now, he's probably not a top 100 prospect, but clearly should have been taken probably before the 24th pick. So, Mason, I love the unique spin that you put on the draft and the process and the scouting. So thanks for joining us today. I know you're busy. I appreciate the time. Really quick, as we're going to start here, because this is like my favorite part of talking to you every year. Who is the guy people aren't talking about enough that the Royals should consider at number nine because he's going to be a stud? Uh, probably Eric Brown, maybe, maybe, uh, not as high as uh, the Royals pick, but like top, top 15, top 20, probably Eric Brown, I would say. Second baseman out of coastal Carolina. Uh, I'm as shortstop. I think it'll be okay. there, but coastal. Yes. And that makes a lot of sense because he's getting a lot of run for being one of the better defensive shortstops in this draft class. So it makes a lot of sense. The Royals would be, <laughs> would be in on him for sure. He's a guy that. Uh, kind of reminds me of of coming on and talking about Trey Sweeney last year, where he's just hit and hit and hit at every level. There's nothing that he does offensively that you look at as a red flag. He looks a little funny swinging the bat. His setup's a little bit different. He pick he can pick it, and it's like it's kind of one of those things where like when you watch Moneyball, he's like he's like I want a guy when he walks in the room that blah 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 has already been here for two minutes. It's like I got an ugly girlfriend, can't draft. <laughs> Sometimes I really think we overthink the MLB draft. And then, you know, there are guys who clearly should have been taken at some point. So Eric Brown is your guy this year, huh? Definitely, yeah. If you were the Royals sitting there with the ninth overall pick and, you know, you've got Elijah Green number one on your board, it looks like it, he could legitimately, in the worst case scenario, be there at number nine. But let's, let's, let's be 
somewhat realistic because I don't think I don't think Tamar Johnson's getting a nine. I don't think Brooks Lee or Jackson Holiday or Drew Jones are getting there. But if you have the ninth overall pick, what is the most realistic thing that you would want the Royals to do if you are a Royals fan that this guy's probably going to be there and they should definitely take him? Definitely cross. Uh, I think he's like kind of similar to Henry Davis. He has like a flat path, just performs really well. Uh, doesn't have like a ton of like in-game power in college, mostly because of the flat path and the fact that he doesn't catch balls out front that much. I think they both had like 15 to 19 home runs, which is still a good amount. But when you hit the ball 150 miles an hour, you know you have an average EV above 90. You expect a little bit more than 15 to 19 home runs. So uh, definitely someone like Cross too, because he could probably play right field, which is valuable, and uh, he could probably hit for contact and power. Gavin Cross, you've got number four on your board. He's a guy that Baseball America, and, and this is where I think is is funny about a guy like Gavin Cross, where Baseball America, if you look at the, you know, the the pre draft rankings and the in the mock drafts that came out, and I mean MLB Pipeline did one last off season during the strike. I'm sorry, during the lockout, Baseball America had one really early on, and Gavin Cross has been there the entire time. At no point in time has Gavin Cross really asserted himself in the top five conversations, but at no point in time has Gavin Cross really fell off and like, well, maybe Gavin Cross isn't a top 10 pick. It seems like through the entire draft process, Gavin Cross has been talked about anywhere from seven to 11. I don't know that I've seen his name outside of those four picks. Do you think he's a guy that at his peak could be Christian Yelich, where I know Yelich won an MVP, but if we remove like an MVP season, Yelich has been an All Star. He's he did win the MVP, but he hasn't like been, you know, the greatest thing since sliced bread in every year. But he's never really been bad either. Like, can he be that? Can he be that model of consistency? Or is it more like you're drafting a guy that we're pretty sure is just going to be a big league regular without maybe any ceiling? Yeah, I think you're buying into more like the floor of like you're you're pretty safe. You feel safe with get like, getting him and getting a win a season pretty much in right field. Josh, you're muted. So I guess you seem to be one of the the guys analyzing this draft class that has that coveted gene of someone who could take all this information um, that that we're given. Um, you can also see the mechanics within whether to be like pitching mechanics or swing mechanics and get the most out of that information, combine them into like a succinct overarching scouting report on a guy. Uh, and with so much information out there, we just talked to Kyle Bodie about this a little bit as well. But there is there a particular stat that is you know most telling for a pitcher and a hitter that, that you kind of look at to be able to base some of these scouting reports on? Is there one particular one that you look at primarily? Uh, I think with hitting, uh, probably just like. You can't be a good hitter and have a bad slash line. Like, you know, like you can't like get lucky so bad that or unlucky so much so that like your slash line's like, a, you know, like a 750 OPS. Yeah. And on the pitching side, I think like you have to throw a certain amount of strikes. Like, I don't think like throwing 75% strikes and throwing 62% strikes matters whatsoever. But like you can't throw 48% strikes, 52% strikes and like be a decent prospect. So throwing strikes. So there, there's, there's a floor that comes with that. And I think when when we're talking about a guy like Elijah Green, who you've got number one on your board, and for good reason, the tools are stupid. He, I, I don't know that I've ever seen, I mean, not ever, but like not since Bryce Harper or maybe even Bob Buett Jr. seen a high school kid hit bombs like that. I mean, that is a mature 18-year-old with the ability to hit a baseball really far. You talk about the ability to, to, to hit well and to make a certain amount of contact. And like with a pitcher, like there's a floor that you have to like – it's almost like a gate. You have to be able to walk through and then other things start to matter, right? Like that speed is probably the most important thing for a hitter. As long as you're not Sully Matias and, and strike out 40% of the time, all the time. So with Elijah green, you must be pretty certain that the swing and the miss, the, the approach the those things that like, if he's there at number nine, people are clearly concerned about it a little bit. You seem to not be that concerned. Yeah. I just like, I think he's pretty similar to Byron Buxton, and Byron Buxton swung and missed 28, 30 percent, 25 percent of the time for his entire minor league career, and he wasn't that good when he originally got called up in the MLB, and now he's like a top 10 player in the MLB. You know, it took a while, but like the tools are so good. Eventually, when you're just that athletic, 
and you're reliant on athleticism, like it eventually just it comes back out. And you develop the skill sets instead of you know having no athleticism and having a skill set and trying to develop athleticism, which is, you know you can't really do. Mm-hmm. So like Elijah, I think you can develop the skill set over time and kind of train making better decisions in order to kind of cut down on the uh, the whiffs, you know, swing less, uh, stuff like that, you know, taking more strikes and in the hopes of swinging that less balls, you know, and you're more likely to swing a miss at a ball than you are to pitch in the zone. And so you swing less pitches out of the zone, you swing it, you know, you swing a miss less. And so stuff like that. I think that type of like an or can, you know, cut down all that stuff with him just through development. Can he run enough to play in center field long-term? Uh, I think so. Yeah. I think he's, 60 runner, 60 glove in center field. Incredible. I mean, that's – I was telling Alex about him specifically. I was like, he's a freak athlete. He's the guy that you can't – you know, you create on a video game and you can't top out his stats. you got to like – he's got to have some kind of flaw, and that's what it seems like to me as 18-year-old Green. That's 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 the guy. What uh, – kind of kind of speaking of the guy, we kind of talked about some hidden gems potentially at 109 in uh, Eric Brown. Are there any like three or four guys that you might have your eye on? I know that like you might be higher on like Owen Murphy or Max Martin, Colby Thomas, Anthony Silva. Those dudes you kind of might be a little higher than you know uh, other other scouts or other uh, ranking sites. Is there is there some hidden gems in the you know maybe after the first pick that we could potentially look at? Uh, I think Colby Thomas could be for sure. He got hurt too, which kind of stunk. Uh, he had some of the best like batted ball day in the country. Just hit the shit out of the ball. Hmm. He hit about 160 miles an hour, too. I mean, it's That'll pretty do. impressive. I don't care who you're facing. <laughs> <laughs> Give me some light tower power and BP at least. Where does where does Kamar Rocker slide, slot into this draft? Like, how, how does this draft look for Kamar Rocker, who I know we went back and forth on Rocker a, a hundred times last spring, <laughs> and I haven't really talked to you about him since. He looks to be kind of like the Kamar Rocker of old, like the the junior year, the first four outings of Kamar Rocker is like what we're looking at kind of at the moment. Is he still a top 15-ish talent? Like is he can does it make sense or is he just gonna have to take what he gets this year? And I mean, I don't think he's a top 15 talent, but like he shoved for three years in college and he's doing pretty dang well in the Frontier League. So like I wouldn't blame anybody for having him super high if you just want to bank on the fact that he was a really good pitcher for three years, not even including the high school days. But uh, I just I don't think I would take him. Based on what he's asking for and based on what he's probably going to take, and I don't think there's any chance I would want to draft him. Well, a guy like him is fascinating to me because we have reached the the end of leverage. There is no more leverage. If he gets drafted by, let's just use the Royals, Royals at number nine this year, and the Royals are like, we're going to give you $2 million. Because did, well, I say that, did Rocker, is he eligible for the combine slash top 300 status? I I don't really know, to be honest. I, I don't think he is because I didn't hear his name at the combine. I don't yeah, I think know if he would submit a pre-draft medical. So let's say the Royals draft him at number nine, and they're like, we're going to give you $2 million. <laughs> that's, that's all we're going to offer you. If you're a rocker, well, what are your options? If you don't take it, how many times can you be drafted and not enter Major League Baseball? I mean, well, at what point does this end for him? Does he just go to Japan and Carter Young his way to four or five million dollars over there? Yeah, I don't know. If he gets two mil at nine, or you said seven, right? He's, the, the Royals pick at number nine. At nine, so yeah, I mean, I don't know how you turn that down. I mean, okay, I don't think you're getting two mil outside of the first round, really. So you, so you think rocker? I mean, I know you don't necessarily know Rocker, like you're not speaking for him, but <laughs> at, at number nine, you offer him two million dollars. Like that, that he that's something he should consider and and take and not complain about too much. Yeah, I mean, I at nine too, I bet you we can get more than that too. I don't think a team's gonna give a guy that big of a discount at nine. What's the what's the slot there? Like five, five and a half. It's close to five. It's right around there. Yeah, I, I feel like at the bare minimum, I'll get like 50, 55, 60%, which I mean, still, it's a ton of money based on where he was a year ago. But uh, hypothetically, like, let's just say they did. Let's say they offered him $1 million. Let's say, I mean, Dayton Moore wouldn't do that. Let's just say they did, and they were just kind of jerks about it. Like, what is the next step? Like, how long, how far away are we from seeing Kamar Rocker? Like, deuces, I'm going to Japan. Like, 
Uh, how many, like, because I feel like there are other high school pitchers who should consider that in some capacity. Yeah, I feel like, uh, um, I, I feel like that's what was going to happen last year. People talked about was him going overseas or something, play professionally, and it just didn't happen. So, trying to find those slot bonuses. That's one hundred percent something that I was interested in as well because we've talked to, uh, we've talked to our buddy Joe Doyle, who was talking about potentially this class being pretty deep in prep arms. And if you are going to under slot there in that first one, you could really get into some pretty solid uh, prep arms to over slot with some of that extra bonus money. So it's definitely seemed like Kumar was a possibility or even, you know, part of a very strong whole draft strategy at that point, if you're comfortable with those prep arms. Yeah, definitely. There's a ton of them too. You still got DeLauder number seven. Bodie was just Kyle Bodie was just on the show talking about how if you wanted to get into like saving a little bit of money at number nine, take Chase DeLauder and 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 save yourself some money for the Royal second pick at number thirty five. Is he is he a center fielder long term? A and B, he was hitting so well. I mean, it was almost like Brooks Lee a little bit where he's hitting so well, but it's a mid major. Why why should we think any differently of DeLauder compared to Brooks Lee? You've got number three, and, and I'm not saying that you do think differently, but I think a lot of publications have Brooks Lee one through four and Chase DeLauder like number 17. They both come from mid majors, they're both good athletes. I don't think Brooks Lee's a shortstop, I don't think DeLauder's a center fielder. One's righty, one's lefty. Like, what's the difference here in terms of outside of a broken foot for DeLauder? Uh, probably Brooks Lee was like good out of high school, like well known at high school too, like offered millions of dollars and turned him down. Uh, I do think Brooks being switch hitting definitely helps him out too. Uh, and Brooks also went and played for the USA team too, which probably helped him out, which, I mean, I don't know how you decided for the difference between the Cape Cod where DeLauder was also obviously really good. And uh, Brooks was also really good for team USA. So uh, I just think it'd probably be the track record with Brooks. And the fact he probably has, he's more likely to stay at short, but I, but I agree with you that he's, they're both probably going to move out of center field and short. One of the guys that we've kind of talked about between, you know, the group of us that uh, Jackson Holiday, and it seems like you are a little bit lower on Jackson than than most of the national guys here. It doesn't seem like I've looked a few different places. I can't find any kind of red flags against Jackson Holiday. What's what's a kind of your read on, on why you might be a little bit lower on him? His athleticism data isn't that great. And I just mm. a shortstop with average athleticism is a little bit concerning for me. Sure. <laughs> is that a average, slightly, I'd say 55 athleticism. Hmm. Is that a is that a defensive thing long term, or is it a offensive concern for the position? Both, probably. Just the fact that eventually you're going to age, and you, you, when you age at shortstop, and if you're more reliant on your glove, kind of like with Lindor, where like long term, you know, you're, you rely on your glove to get your the value out of a player, and you get to 32, and all of a sudden you're a below average defender, and it's not really working out anymore. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask you about a couple of local kids. Number 55 on your top 100 board, Jacob Mizorowski, Grain Valley High School kid, just a few minutes from the Kauffman Stadium. Big kid, reaching 100 with regularity, good extension, good spin. Crowder, he's at, he's at Crowder Community College right now. I kind of look at Mizorowski and think, he has to almost has to be in an organization that can really develop pitchers. If he gets drafted by the Rockies, like you're looking at like, I don't want to say Riley Pine, put that on the kid, but like he, he's going to have to have some development, but he's also the kid like Kyle brought it up with Shane McClanahan. It's like when Shane McClanahan got to the Rays, I looked at the board and went, you've got to be kidding me. Like, of course, Shane McClanahan is going to go play for the Rays. He's definitely going to be really good now. Like that, it makes too much sense. Yeah. Mizorowski's like that, where it's like, you know, I I love the Royals and, and I hope the best for Jacob. I just don't know that it's a great fit. But it's also like if the Royals pass on him and he gets to the Dodgers or something, look out because this kid's going to be a freak. So, I mean, do you have any general thoughts on Mizorowski? Because you've got him pretty high compared to where a lot of places have him. Yeah, I absolutely love him. I think he's a good mover, I think he's going to throw gas. And I think he already throws gas. And I think he's just going to keep doing it. And his fastball feeds good. He's got really good breaking ball pitch, too. I just love him, man. 
and he's you know he's also got your starting build too so it's like uh, what else you need you know, if you, <laughs> the only thing you can really ask for is him being in division one and shoving and performing against the, the other division one guys have you seen carson milbrand at all Vanderbilt? Uh, i have i have yes the the picture any, any, uh, thoughts, on, any thoughts on milbrand liberty high school uh graduate i believe i have him I have him on my board somewhere I, yeah i got him uh let's pull it up I have him 241st right or 241st right now. Okay. So kind of high, I guess. I've seen him higher though for sure from Pipeline and all those those publications. I'll say Baseball America had him like 86 earlier this yeah. year. Really? Yeah. Uh just fastball is a little bit generic. It's like a, a sinker from a low release, but uh definitely has a really good uh slider too. I like it. Mm-hmm. So let's let's get you out on the. We've kind of talked to a few draft uh, draft guys so far, and let's get them all out on the same question here. Uh, the official prediction: Royals are on the clock at one oh nine. We've talked about Eric Brown. Is that your your official prediction, or is there is there uh, an actual like a change of thought and uh, between best available and what the Royals are going to do? So Eric Brown was just like someone I would probably like to uh, take high uh, for the Royals. I would probably guess uh, you know I'll guess Cross. That makes mm. that makes a lot of sense, just because he's someone I think might actually be available there. I can see them yeah. taking someone like him. Do you That'd think he can move that. through a system like quickly? Like, is he is he the type of college hitter like Jonathan India? You draft him, and then two three years later, like he's in the middle of your lineup. I think he is offensively very similar to Henry Davis. I think really really similar. That would and Henry Davis, by the way, for anybody listening who may not know, went one one last year. He was the first overall pick a catcher out of Louisville by the Pittsburgh Pirates. So anything you can get like a left-handed Henry Davis stick would be uh, extremely good value there at number nine. I'm personally rooting for the rare situation where Elijah Green falls to number nine. We will see. I'm a big Jet Williams fan myself. So Mason, I really appreciate you coming on again. If you, if you don't follow Mason on Twitter, Mason underscore M-C-R-A-E. It is my favorite in, in terms of like unique because Baseball America, MLB Pipeline, fan graphs have their own twist. Mason, you put one of my favorite spins on the draft. I'm really looking forward to it this year. Are you participating in the Prospects Live Mock tonight? I'm not. No, I was in the last two, but, it, you know, couldn't go three years in a row. Someone's got to be a Blue Jays fan having fun. I got you. All right, man. <laughs> well, enjoy the draft. Enjoy the season. I'm sure we'll do it again next year. Really appreciate your time. We'll talk to you again soon, man. Thank you guys for having me on. All right, well, that wraps up this episode of the Royals Farm Report podcast. Josh, it has been a long hour and a half. Thanks for joining me. That was some incredible conversation between Mr. Bodie and Mason. Thanks to KCSC for sponsoring the show. Another show where we didn't get to a minor league minute. That will be back next week for sure. But thank you to Drum Farm Center for Children for picking up the minor league minute this year. Thanks to Tickets for Less. Thanks to Tucker on the other side of the screen. who have been sitting here listening to us talk for 90 minutes. So we appreciate everybody involved. We will see you guys again very soon.